Welcome. Welcome to this special Lavender series in partnership with San Francisco Pride. In just a couple of days, it's official. It'll be Pride Month. And so I think I can say it. Happy Pride. Tonight, we have a special conversation, and it is about the state of LGBTQI cultural districts. I'm Michelle Miao, a member of the Board of Governors for the Commonwealth Club of California. Since COVID-19, we have had to shut our doors to our live audience programming and also now virtually producing our programs open, accessible, and free to our community. So if you're able and you can, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online and support the work of the Commonwealth Club. The San Francisco Pride and Commonwealth Club Lavender Series is generously supported by Comcast, and many thanks to the San Francisco Pride legacy partners such as Bud Light, Hilton San Francisco Union Square, KPIX 5 CBS Bay Area, Kaiser Permanente, Genentech, Gilead, GLBT Historical Society, KBCW TV, Park 55 San Francisco, Smirnoff, Recology, and T-Mobile. And now I'm pleased to introduce to you our esteemed panel here to talk about cultural districts. Where, where in the world could you find a transgender cultural district, LGBTQ, and a le leather district all in the same city? Well, San Francisco, of course. We have Bob Goldfarb, who's the president of the Leather and LGBTQ Cultural District, also president, friends of the Eagle Plaza, and former president of Folsom Street Events, Aria Saeed, who's the who is a uh, co-founder and executive director of the Transgender District and also founder of Queen Cultural Initiative and an advocate. Julia Sabori, who's the cultural district's manager, San Francisco Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development and Sparks, co-chair of the Castro LGBTQ Cultural District and also executive director of the Masto Foundation. Welcome, everyone, and happy pride. <laughs> I think mean, right. We could say it. We could say it. So, Hi. yeah, Hi. Yes. let's get in the spirit. I saw three LGBTQ rainbow flags uh, up on Market Street, and so I think by June first, you know, it, it'll be our tradition all across, all along uh, Market Street. And uh, of course, it's going to feel emotional, as we know our Pride celebration has changed just a bit be, uh, due to the pandemic. But like I opened up with, where in the world? Could you find all of this fabulous cultural districts all in one city? And of course, it, it would be San Francisco. And so San Francisco, the city, you know, it, it's special. And I think it all means something to us. And so if you'll start uh, and, and just open up about, you know, your own journey coming to this great city and what it means to you, we'll start with Aria. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um... San Francisco is absolutely an incredible city. Um, and it's a huge part of my own experience in my work and, and definitely inspires it. Um, I moved to San Francisco. I've shared my story tons of times, but I moved to San Francisco when I was 19. Um, and like so many queer and trans people, um, home where I was, um, which happened to be Portland, Oregon, if you can believe it. And yes, there are, you know, in Portland, trust me. Um, but home was not safe. It was not affirming. And so like so many people across the country and, you know, people who come here from different countries, um, everyone said, go to San Francisco. San Francisco is going to be the safe space um, where you'll be accepted and they have tons of people like you. And so I got my Greyhound bus ticket um, and I had $60 in my purse and I took the Greyhound and got down here and um, yeah, my experience was, you know, being a poor black trans youth in the Tenderloin and um, I've had so many incredible moments in San Francisco um, and I've also experienced disparity like some other communities, but um, San Francisco is definitely in my heart um, and the Tenderloin especially. And so I make sure to always try to represent it, um, not just here, but in other countries that I get a chance to, to do trans advocacy in. Sparks. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, 
So, so for me, ever since I came out, I was drawn to queer communities. So um, landing in San Francisco was a very, um, always a goal of mine. I saw San Francisco as a utopia of queer activism, culture and history. Um, and I knew that it was a place where I could live really to my full potential. Um, a, a really important thing too, is that I came here also knowing that I didn't just want to reap the benefits of, of San Francisco, of the strong social and political um, acceptance of LGBTQ folks. Um, I knew that as a person who wanted to create change in the world, I didn't want to just uh, become complacent and maintain status quo. Um, I think that also translates to the work that we're doing in the uh, Castro LGBTQ district that um, in terms of wanting to leverage the opportunities here and our collective power to do things that can't be done in other communities um, and really push and promote not only queer communities in the U.S., but uh, to serve a model, test things out, um, give voice to people that don't have voice, and just celebrate the amazingness of, of our LGBTQ identities and our queerness. And so. Um, that's what San Francisco means to me. Julia. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, well, first, before I get started, I wanted to first honor and give gratitude to the First Nation people of this land, San Francisco, the Ramatush Ohlone uh, people, and give thanks um, for, you know, to their, their ancestors for allowing us to be here to organize, to raise our families. Um, and I'm just really honored to be in this role of the cultural district's manager. It's a blessing. Um, I came to San Francisco when I was about about six years old um, with my mom and my dad in tow. And went to elementary school, middle school, high school, and raising my children now here. It's my home place. Um, it's my first love. And what better way to love on my city than, you know, um, empower, support, and amplify the beautiful cultural communities that we have had here since the beginning of time. So to be clear, just because we have the cultural district's legislation or the program at the mayor's office of housing community development, um, that doesn't at all mean that, you know, decades and decades of legacy and work and um, power warriors were, ha were making things happen in this city. So we, I'm part of a long path of, of justice and, um, and empowerment, right? And so in my role now is to really embrace these cultural districts, try to give them as many resources as possible, support them, um, and then translate to the city policymakers and departments on what the community needs, you know, and what, what these folks are hearing on the ground. How can we really strengthen, you know, what's working and also address what's not. So, um, not much else to say about how I got here, but I'm not going anywhere. And actually, these are the folks that really should be holding the floor. And they're doing um, amazing, beautiful work. And Bob? I came up here in 19, I think it was 87 or 88 with a boyfriend for Folsom Street Fair. And the bars were packed and the streets were filled with leather people all over the place. And I was like, this is pretty cool. And that was the sort of thing that I was looking for where I was living in San Diego and I wasn't finding it. And so I started coming up here five to seven days uh, out of every month. And I really enjoyed the time that I, I spent here. And San Francisco was the, the place for me where I could walk into the hotel lobby in full leather on a Sunday afternoon and the doorman would open the door and say, taxi to the Eagle. And so I was coming back from uh, a leather event in the Midwest and with a bunch of other friends and all of the fun people were going down one concourse to the San Francisco flight. And I was going down another concourse to uh, a different plane. And I said to myself, I am getting on the wrong plane. And six weeks later, I got my place here. And San Francisco to me has always been a place that 
I could be with like-minded people and people who appreciated the things that I appreciated and no explanation was necessary. That's awesome. Thank you to you all. I want to read a quote from a very well-known San Francisco journalist and columnist, uh, Herb Kane, who once said, a city is a state of mind, of taste, of opportunity. A city is a marketplace where ideas are traded, opinions clash, and eternal conflict may produce eternal truth. I thought that was just so, so powerful. And having lived, you know, in the San Francisco Bay Area for the last 20 years, that um, uh, all of it, you know, the, the, the love and the, the fighting, but, but the fighting even more because you're, you know that you're having conversations, you're sharing food, you're sharing ideas. I think that's why we, we love, you know, this, the city so much. It's filled with so many incredible people that you share these experiences with. And so when you think about like cultural districts um, in the history of it, and I'm such a geek about this, right? Like how does, how does it actually all happen? Like who comes together and says, you know what? Let's put a gay flag right here in, in, in this very, you know, corner of 18th and Castro or the leather flag in uh, Soma or on Folsom or uh, the trans flag and in, in, in the colors, you know, in the Tenderloin. I mean, all these neighborhoods, these districts mean something so much to us than even just, you know, the flag and its symbols. So I'll start with, with Julia because you probably have you know, so much perspective, even just from a, a city planning point of view, you know, how these districts come together. And then, and then it would be neat to hear from everybody else how your districts came together. Julia. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. And, you know, I, first I want to say, um, you know, I've been, I've been an organizer since a youth, right? And I have to say, um, I was always organizing around racial justice, juvenile justice, criminal justice. And one of the things, you know, in the 90s and, and you know, early 2000s, when we were trying to figure out how to um, gain equity for our black and brown young folks, it w- we actually looked to the LGBTQ community in San Francisco because they were always ahead of the game in terms of making inroads into uh, policy development and uh, getting a seat at the table at City Hall, um, the Human Rights Commission, uh, you know, making creating reports about you know the the act, the lack of access for small business owners for the LGBTQ community having the pride parade all of those things um, you know were sanctioned and space was made for this community that had been, you know is at many in many aspects at the margins um, but you know as a black and brown community we were trying to find space at that table and we said look at look look to the LGBTQ um, organizers and to the to the freedom fighters and the stakeholders and let's follow the path that they're that they're making right um, and so now fast forward you know a year ago year and a half ago the board of supervisors approved legislation to support cultural districts as a, an actual um, part of the city charter because we're facing so much displacement in San Francisco and because of the affordability crisis, you know, um, our trans young folks and our, you know, LGBTQ community, our black community um, in the Bayview, like our young folks, are they going to be able to live here in 20 years and afford a home? Are they going to have space and programs and nonprofits to walk into? Are the murals going to still exist, right? And so Supervisor Ronan, along with all of the other supervisors, wrote this legislation to really institutionalize cultural districts and to institutionalize community development. Um, And so that legislation was passed. And then shortly thereafter on the November ballot, Proposition E was added and it passed um, by a majority of over 70 percent by the voters to say, yes, the voters were saying we need our arts, but we also need our culture and we need our community. So that allocated a portion of the hotel tax fund to actually fund cultural districts. 
which is important, right? So if we have other planners from other cities listening, it's not just about writing down that we care about this, but it's about allocating dollars to it and writing that into the code. So that really set up the blueprint. Then there were five cultural districts that organized hand in hand with that supervisor and, and wrote it and analyzed and got it passed. And since then, we've added three more cultural districts in the Bayview, Castro, and also uh, the American Indian Cultural District. So that's just really that first um, push that path got us into action. And then I, you know, open it up to, to my colleagues here. Sparks, how did, how did the, uh, the Castro, you know, cultural district happen? I know that's, that's all in one show, um, but you'll do your best. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, it's funny, Michelle, for you to ask me right after um, Julia, because we of the LGBTQ cultural districts are the most infant. Um, if uh, you started by saying, you know, the city is a state um, of mind of taste. If we are a state, we are a state in development. That is for sure. Um, we, uh, before we actually elected our first board members, there were, were over a year and a half of working groups that um, came together to gather feedback and, and figure out, start thinking about our visioning, our, our election procedures, our outreach uh, in in November, we elected our first five board members. Uh, in January, we held our second election, our next five board members, and um, we were in the process um, before COVID happened of electing our final five um, board members. These all happened through public elections um, where more than 200 people participated in each election, which just reflects people's excitement um, about supporting um, uh, the cultural districts and and uh, the LGBTQ cultural district. Um, and so we're still coming together. We recently submitted um, our proposal to the city um, and and we're diving into all of it. We, um, we're all excited. We recognize that uh, cultural preservation and promoting a cultural legacy is not something that just happens. It's something that needs to be developed diligently, mindfully, collectively, and collaboratively. So we all hold those values, um, but also working across all of our differences um, to, to figure out how, how we're going to move forward. So that's, that's where we are right now. Aria, also a very exciting transgender cultural district. Um, it's the first in the entire country, uh, if not the world. Yeah, um, which is absolutely incredible. I have, I know that that's like our tagline, I guess, but I still have trouble digesting what that means. Um, and I think that's a huge part of just our journey. Um, so, you know, the transgender district, um, we did not initially set out to start a district. Um, I don't think that was something that we knew was possible. Um, our work really sort of was in response to uh, development um, encroaching in the Tenderloin. And so um, for those listening um, in San Francisco, uh, there have been certain neighborhoods that have traditionally held um, a community or a population. Um, and then the term is, is gentrification where um, new people are coming in um, and the housing market goes up. Um, the cost of living overall um, becomes inaccessible for the people that have traditionally lived in that neighborhood. And so um, with the Mission District and SOMA in particular, um, we, we were absolutely afraid that Tenderloin was sort of the new front frontier um, because politically it's always been the most undesirable neighborhood for City Hall when it comes to politics. Um, it's the last to get the streets paved. It's the last to get street cleaned. Um, like the Tenderloin has largely been neglected by our city and, um, and it's been happening for over a hundred years. Um, and so, you know, when this developer was coming in, while we can't stop someone from purchasing um, a plot of land or a city block like they did, we wanted to ensure that they provided a community benefit to specifically the trans community um, in the Tenderloin because Compton, the site of Compton's Cafeteria Riot is literally diagonal um, across the street 
from their site of luxury condos and hotels. And so that, that advocacy was really sort of rooted in fear of possible displacement. Um, for those who don't know, the Tenderloin um, has perhaps the largest transgender population of any neighborhood in San Francisco, but perhaps also the country. Um, and transgender people have continuously resided in the neighborhood um, as early documented as the 1920s. And so having access to that, to that rich history really helped us catapult our effort in getting a community benefit process from the developer. And then in our planning, um, we discovered that it was absolutely possible to start a district um, so that trans people a hundred years from now can inherit um, an urban space and place um, that says that you belong here. Um, the district was founded by three black trans women. I think that's always important to highlight. It was myself, um, Honey Mahogany and Janetta Johnson. And um, Janetta and I have specifically lived in the Tenderloin for, for many years. And so um, that and, and the experience of our sisters, when you come to San Francisco as a black trans woman, you know, everyone says it's amazing and it's all accepting. Um, and, and that is true to some regard, but then you're like sort of stuck in the Tenderloin. Um, and no one cares, no one's helping you, you know, for us and, and the girls that I knew and I came up with, you know, we could get our hormones for free, but we couldn't get housing. No one would hire us. Like we would go into job interviews and, and get laughed at um, in San Francisco on Fourth and Market. And so we sort of had this experience of being disillusioned um, and sort of feeling forgotten um, in San Francisco in the mix. Um, of course, gay white people hold a lot of political power in San Francisco. And so people are always like, oh, LGBT people have a voice, but um, you know, who is represented in that? It's never been black trans women. And so that was really sort of the spirit behind our advocacy um, and ensuring that um, people of color, trans people, um, are represented intersectionally in the neighborhood. Um, and I think, I think we did that. I think our work gives people hope. Um, and we've gotten um, inquiries from trans people in Paris and Brazil and wherever else, uh, New York, Atlanta, New Orleans, and they want to start a district of their own. Um, and I think that's incredible because I think we finally get to have a place um, that we get to call home. Um, and a sense of belonging. And that's, that's what we're promoting. That's so beautiful. Bob, also very exciting. And uh, I'm not sure, but definitely maybe one of the first, <laughs> a, a leather LGBTQ cultural district here in San Francisco. Uh, we believe it's the, the first leather cultural district in the world, actually. We, we, don't, we can't back that up, but uh, we, we certainly believe it's true. And the leather community started to really locate in Soma uh, in the 60s. And it has uh, been quite strong there ever since. And in the summer of 1980, there were 55 leather and LGBTQ businesses in Soma. And today we count 14, and well, actually now 13 with the um, uh, closure or relocation of the stud. And the displacement of uh, the, the leather stores, businesses, clubs uh, has been something that has happened since the 80s. And the Folsom Street Fair was started in 1984 in response to gentrification and displacement. And so we're seeing that resurgence and displacement uh, at this time. And the cultural districts uh, are, I think, the more modern way or the, the newest way, the newest tool in the toolbox uh, to deal with that. And the, it's, the, the leather community has been uh, a real uh, focus and one of the elements that makes San Francisco unique and a wonderful place to live and a real symbol of its tolerance. 
And so it is our objective to keep that going. And about 10 years ago, um, starting about 10 years ago, there were a couple of attempts to create something along the lines of a cultural district, and they never quite gained traction. Uh, and about, let's see, it was in 2018, uh, Rachel Ryan, uh, working with Supervisor Kim, uh, established legislation uh, to found the Leather and LGBTQ Cultural District. Uh, she began having community meetings, which I started attending, and wound up at some point getting elected chair of. And so it was with the community support and the support of the supervisors and the mayor that the cultural district came to be. And I went and lobbied all of the supervisors and I wasn't really sure what to expect, you know, when I went to all of the supervisor's offices. And I have to say that absolutely every single San Francisco supervisor was completely supportive. Uh, there was no reticence or hesitation. Uh, there was 100% support from all of them. And our resolution passed uh, unanimously and uh, it's with that combination of city support and the mayor's office and the supervisors uh, that the district came to be. That's awesome. That's so incredible. That's why we, we I, I say we love the city, but I think we love, we love us. We love our community who make things happen. Uh, thank you to our audience members who are sending in questions and comments. Please keep them coming. We love when you're engaged in the program. Uh, I love it because then it means I don't have to ask all the questions. Um, I want to read a couple comments and then it, it, leading up to a question from an audience member. Uh, I moved to San Francisco in 1995, mostly to be among gay friends I knew online. Yes, in 1995. Sadly, I was priced out. So much of what is said here reminds me of what I miss. Another comment, I'm interested in seeing more environmental justice and equity building as well as preservation for these cultural districts. And so that leads to a question, I think, you know, because you all have kind of touched on the heart of, of why these cultural districts are necessary. Um, but what does it mean to you to have a cultural district supporting this aspect of your life? And uh, we will start with Sparks. Um, and sorry, Michelle, can you repeat the, the question one more time? I think my thing blipped out. Yeah, yeah. There were just some comments, you know, you, and, and all of the panelists had really talked about the importance of having, right, these cultural districts and kind of what they mean to us um, from some of the social justice issues that we face and, um, you know, issues around even migrating to, you know, a city like San Francisco. So what does it mean to you? And this is a question from our audience. Um, to have a cultural district supporting this aspect of your life? Um, so there, uh, you know, the city um, and in the time in the last 16 years that I've been here, uh, this city has definitely evolved and changed. And right now in just the last few months, um, it's changed in ways that we uh, never would have imagined. Uh, and, and I really think right now uh, for the cultural district, um, actually one of our, our hope and goals is to push back against change. Although change equals progress, um, change um, and increasingly with the economic challenges that we're facing um, with limited housing, access to resources, um, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we realized with the uh, Castro LGBTQ Cultural District that, that one of our roles is to um, put, put the brakes on those negative changes that are, are pushing our um, communities out uh, and, and create opportunities to gather uh, wider feedback, to engage more people in the conversation, to um, bring visibility uh, to issues um, for folks that, that haven't um, been able to have a voice. Uh, and so, uh, we, um, we really, um, want, want to do that. And, and again, still trying to, without the diversity of, of our group, figure all this out. But, 
um, hoping in, in the future that where we are a year from now or two years from now, three years from now, um, we'll have improved uh, things in the Castro, not just um, for the LGBTQ community, but for LGBTQ communities around the world to see. Anyone want to add to that before we move to the next question? All right. Speaking of, uh, you know, change, I had this question here and I was, I was thinking about it because like change is a constant in a city like San Francisco. And I think what keeps us coming back is, you know, fighting the change in a lot of ways. Like uh, many of us who can stay or even if, you know, uh, the displacement is happening, there are other folks in our community who will step up and fight for us. Some of us stay to fight the change and some of us embrace the change as the constant beauty of the city. But how does your cultural district adapt, you know, to that idea, especially especially when all that we we have to do all that we can to preserve and, and you know, its uniqueness and what the purpose that it serves for our community. Like the district, you, you it's not there just just as like Aria said one day, um, you know, this is going to be a, a symbol for future generations of transgender people to know that they have a home, that, that there, there's, a, there's a city, there's a place uh, for them. And so kind of along those idea, you know, of, of this change, I mean, how does the cultural district adapt to that? Like, if you know, understand what I'm saying, I mean, the, the Castro, for example, looks completely different than when it started uh, the transgender cultural district continues to adapt to that change in a lot of ways, um, and and so on. So we'll start with Aria, just because you know I, I did. You brought it up. Yeah, I mean, I think we would be amiss to not acknowledge um, while we are fighting um, the impact of change. I think we would be amiss if we didn't sort of adapt with it. San Francisco is not the same city that I lived in 10 years ago. Um, and it's not going to be, unfortunately. Um, it, first of all, has a very different industry. Once upon a time, San Francisco used to have a stock exchange. It does not have a stock exchange anymore, but its commerce now is, is tech. And for so many years in the beginning of my advocacy in particular, we were always sort of fighting like no tech, techies go away, like all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I think as I matured in my advocacy and, and specifically with the district, I have been meeting with tech companies and like, okay, you all are here and it looks like you guys are here to stay. So how can we bring trans folks in here? How, we, how can we create economic pipe, pipelines for trans people to be stabilized long-term in their own lives? Um, and how do we create something that's more equitable? And how can you reach back? And the response that I've found has been really surprising. So, you know, we are partnering with a developer that has moved into our neighborhood. Um, and in our um, advocacy, we will have um, a community center and it's currently being built, right? Um, and they have sponsored the entirety of the cost um, towards that. Um, I've partnered with Sephora and LinkedIn and other companies um, to be more intentional on how to, um, and it, be more intentional in hiring specifically trans people of color, but also communities of color and, and folks uh, who are more marginalized and disenfranchised. And yeah, I think cultural districts also have to acknowledge who else is in the neighborhood. So, um, with my team, something that we always talk about is the Tenderloin specifically is perhaps one of the most diverse neighborhoods in San Francisco. There's a huge Arab population, Vietnamese, Cambodian, um, Black, et cetera, homeless, housed. Like, and so how does our work, uh, while specific in uplifting um, the voices and the lived experience of trans people, um, how does our work also benefit them? Um, the, the rest is a population that lives in the neighborhood. And so in our work with uh, Julia's office and um, with the SFMTA and um, Department of Public Works, they changed their name, SF Public Works. Um, you know, we've been advocating for more trees, um, for the sidewalks to be 
tribute to the trans community and to trans history um, to develop the streets and install more crosswalks. And, um, and the city has been absolutely receptive of that. And so in the coming years, um, it'll be both a benefit to the trans community and the broader population that lives in the neighborhood. And so I think change is just sort of ever present and like the experience that we're having now with COVID-19, you just have to adapt um, and ensure that the, the guiding values um, of your district um, or your effort are still maintained with the adaptation. For ours, the trans district, the trans district is for anyone and everyone who identifies as trans or gender non-conforming or relates to that experience in any way. Um, but it was important that our leadership represent um, the trans people that often live in this area um, in particular, and that is Black trans women. And so, you know, while we are uplifting Black trans women into leadership and, and pipelines for business ownership, we believe that that will then benefit everyone. And if you support and create solutions for the most impacted of your community, then everyone benefits. Um, and so that's just part of adapting to that change. I was going to say, Julia, do you want to follow that? Um, just for <laughs> also, sure. yeah, how, how does this city... Not- yeah, adapt to, to the change and also being protective of its cultural districts. Well, I you know, to echo change is inevitable. It's part of our, you know, our human thread and our existence of life, you know, um, and it brings a lot of trauma, right? And if we go back to the gold rush days and to folks coming in from all places of this globe, uh, it displaced native people, you know, in a, in a very genocidal, violent way. And that was the, the fuel of that was, was capitalism. And here we are today, you know, uh, gentrification or, or the, the housing crisis again is traumatic and it is fueled by capitalism. So how do we balance um, access and equity and make sure that like our communities that have every right and and every essence of life that want to continue to live here still have the place to do that. I have lost so many of my friends and family um, in San Francisco. I feel a little bit, you know, of the last of my tribe here trying to hold on and um, and I, me and my colleagues that are from San Francisco in the city say like, you know, go hard, go hard or go home. Like this is our last ditch effort. We're going to save the soul of San Francisco by any means necessary. And what that means is by supporting the leadership of the communities to continue to organize and prepare our people to stay and to make sure that there's access to resources, right? And so one of the key um, staples of the cultural districts is to build a better, stronger, clearer relationship between the community stakeholders and organizations and the city departments. And so it's not really about learning some crazy blueprint map of how City Hall works anymore. It is a different day in that City Hall and departments are more open, right? And so we have a a, a city department steering committee that has planning department, Office of Economic Workforce Development, Arts Commission, Historic Preservation are all at the table on a weekly basis with me. figuring out how do we get resources to these cultural districts in a more expedited and efficient way. You know, Bob gives us a call directly and says this, you know, this business is in danger. What can we do? And, you know, we do the best we can. We put our capes on and, you know, we try to problem solve. We can't always, you know, do everything, which is like heartbreaking, but we do our best. Right. And, um, we do what we can. And the most important piece is about opening up communication so that we can find out how to better serve our communities. Um, and I'd say, you know, I have a lot of really beautiful elders in my life that help me navigate life, right? And this work is part of life. This is spiritual work that we're doing. And COVID-19 has made us all focus inward 
on the essentials that our that our families and our relatives need, and the cultural districts are going to respond to that. Um, already, like Aria is, has been, and the the uh, trans cultural district has been giving um, emergency funding to the trans community since day one. Right, uh, she moved mountains and made that happen, regardless of you know city red tape, or whatever. You know, I know you got to do what you got to do. And before the cultural, the Castro cultural district was even, you know, the ink was dry. They were already, you know, putting up murals and trying to help beautify the Castro and all the boards. So it's about taking change as an element of our life and being like what Bruce Lee would say, be like water and adapt and be flexible and do the best you can to be fluid. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Speaking of, you know, uh, I mean, we talk a lot about what it means to us and because we're the ones, you know, doing the work, you're the ones doing the work um, and making sure that our, our identity and our safety is there in these cultural districts. But I also think, you know, these cultural districts um, transform people, people who may not have ever uh, known about a transgender flag or, or walking the Castro for the very first time. And now you know, the leather LGBTQ cultural district. And some will say, like, what exactly is that? You know, what what's the leather community? Um, so Bob, we'll start with you in, you know, in, in talking about how the neighborhoods, the districts can transform human beings, um, not just from like a, a tourist point of view, but, you know, for educational and, and, and to be informative for those purposes. Well, I think there are a lot of different ways uh, that uh, we work to do that. The part of it is uh, elements that I'll call placemaking. Uh, in in our district, uh, there is what what's called the Ringgold Alley Memoir Walk, and the on Ringgold Alley there are a series of plaques on the sidewalks as well as standing stones that commemorate the businesses and people that are no longer with us. And the people who were chosen were iconic for some reason, whether it was you know, the bar they owned or their activism or their art. And it is those sorts of memorial elements uh, to remind people what was here originally uh, and what we, we no longer have uh, that sort of informs, you know, why is Mr. S here? Why is the eagle there? and sort of let people know what this uh, area in the district was all about. And in addition to that, there are a number of groups uh, in, uh, in the district that operate in the district that uh, offer educational programs about the you know, various aspects of uh, leather and the, those organizations offer them the, instruction at different levels. Uh, some are at the very high level, more philosophical um, uh, perspective, and some are a little more hands-on, shall we say. And so I think that those are the ways that uh, the, the leather community is trying to inform people what it means to be leather, what that, what that is about. And part of our job as a cultural district is to make sure that the groups who are providing that are education and those memorial placemaking items are uh, both uh, continued and added to in the future. And you know, one of our objectives is to make sure that our community groups have space to meet, uh, which is uh, very important and getting extremely difficult um, to find a uh, reasonable, reasonably priced meeting space uh, for uh, grassroots groups to meet. And it's our long run objective to uh, purchase a building in Soma so that we can have a community center uh, from which we cannot be displaced. Sparks, what about the, the Castro uh, LGBTQ cultural district? You know, the, the, the neighborhood and the history of the Castro has been around a while, but you had mentioned earlier that the the structure, the organization, is quite fairly new. But um, I think that all comes full circle to you know it, what the history means to the city, but what people know about the LGBTQ community. Um, 
And then also now, even though things have changed, we've talked about changed a lot, um, the, the, the history continues on and it continues to transform people's lives. Um, I think one of the things that, that we as a board right now um, are, are all, that is on the top of our minds um, is, is, as you pointed out, the celebrating the rich history of the Castro, um, the political significance, our leaders, um, but also most definitely at the center acknowledging um, the, the vast majority of individuals um, now who have been excluded um, from those histories um, and, and acknowledging the reality that, uh, the unfortunate reality that for most people of color, particularly black and brown folks, trans, non-binary folks and queer women, the, the Castro continues to fail in reflecting the diversity, the beautiful diversity of, of our community. Um, and so, uh, and, and in many ways, uh, continues to, to cater to folks who are affluent, white, and, and or gay. Um, a lot of people, as much as I, as much as my heart fills with pride and swells with pride when I see the Castro theater sign or when I hear the flag flapping above my head. Um, it, it is so important that, that we understand that there is so much potential of the Castro to truly reflect the beautiful diversity within our community. Um, and, and it's important to, to me and to us when people come from around the world, when people look at what we've created and built in the Castro culture, district that they see their stories reflected in that so so as we're in formation one of the things that that we're really doing is all of us have collectively agreed that inclusivity and diversity is going to be something that is at the forefront it's not just going to happen is something that we need to absolutely push for um, if you build it they will not come we actually need to proactively reach out and invite people in people that maybe haven't felt safe um, or haven't felt community from the Castro. So um, those are, well, also on, on our board, balancing people with very different backgrounds, interests, um, goals, um, so that's really all, a lot of the things that, that we're grappling uh, with right now, celebrating the history, um, acknowledging the failures in our history, um, and inviting more people in to, to create a better future. I'm going to go back to our audience. Thanks again for joining us and, um, and sending in your questions and your comments. They're so great. Um, we have from George Ridgely, who would like for you to all, all to know, thank you for the work that each of every one of you is doing to preserve our history, honor our ancestors, and enrich life in San Francisco for all of us. We have another comment. We in San Francisco are so fortunate to have the vision, dedication, and hard work of these amazing individuals, so thank you. Um, tech companies, yes, make them engage. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So a question from the audience, are there any additional LGBTQ cultural districts that are being considered? And if so, what's the status? Uh, Julia is smiling, at, you know, it, it, is there secret planning happening? Is another cultural district popping up? The first of something? Oh, uh, not that I know of. I, I, I smile because I have such a bountiful and abundance of work to do already with these beautiful eight cultural <laughs> districts. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming to think of new ones. Um, but, you know, the community will talk and we will respond and I will, you know, be I will be present for that, you know, um, it's just me at MOHCD doing the cultural district magic, um, but that's a blessing and it's, I get to learn a lot. And there's, you know, we're going into our second fiscal year with our first cohort of cultural districts. Um, and so the work continues and it's, it, it's an exciting time. Um, it's exciting to bring on Castro and American Indian. And one of the important things for us is that we work together as a cohort because we're more powerful together, right? Our, our, there's so much intersectionality between our histories 
throughout the cultural districts that together we can build policy that's going to benefit everybody. Um, so I look forward to this COVID being over so we can all get back in the room together and celebrate successes. But also, you know, we will continue to do it in Zoom too. But if anybody hears of another one coming up, you know, let, let me know. <laughs> Speaking of the work, I mean, is there anything that you could uh, maybe tease us with of you know, some ideas that have been floating of what changes might come to your your district or maybe some, some policy, some ideas of how it might impact lives in your district? This is a question to anyone who wants to jump in and share with us. <laughs> Literally, like, Aria. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I can spill that tea yet. Oh, no. Oh, come um, on. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any changes um, in policies? Um, yeah, we're trying to grapple with what what a, what is the role of a cultural district um, in, a, in a virtual world. Um, you know, our work was sort of founded to actually bring community together um, and create space for that. And um, we are adapting. I mean, we've, we've been um, having virtual hangout sessions um, for community. Um, our community advisory council is now virtual, which is comprised of, of residents who are trans um, in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, we did have to cancel like our huge upcoming events. And I think um, cause they were in person. And so something we struggle with is, um, what, what is the role of a cultural district, um, in 2019 or what year is it? Oh my God. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. What is our role in a COVID-19, there we go, COVID-19 world, um, and after, um, and will it be the same? Because I know personally for me, and, and we've been hearing from community, there's, um, the longer, you know, I think it's 76 days of quarantine so far. Um, I don't know who's counting, but um, that I have developed an agoraphobia. Other people have developed a, an intense fear of going outside um, and definitely a fear of, of possible interaction with more than four people. So, um, so yeah, I don't know what comes next, um, but we are working on stuff and, and we're making decisions like whether we have an office or not or all those things just because um, we just don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Anyone want to add to that? Well, I, I think similarly, uh, as far as change goes in the age of COVID-19, we're similarly doing online programs uh, to try and create a sense of community. So the, all of the, the bars and nightlife uh, venues are of course closed. And so we're doing uh, happy hours uh, every week where we have a bartender and uh, people can sign on and chat just as if uh, they were at the bar. And uh, we're also doing erotic storytelling nights and we're looking at adding some similar programs, uh, you know, again, to sort of create this sense of community uh, and provide an outlet uh, for, you know, people who have to stay at home now. And, uh, you know, which uh, that's one of the big parts of our district. And so we're looking for ways to make that happen when we do have to stay at home. Mm. Did you say erotic storytelling night? Yes, I did. Oh, well, I'd like to join that. Thank you, Bob. Well, you are welcome. <laughs> I am happy to send you the link. Um, I've had so much fun <laughs> with you all, and it's just been so great. And, and hearing your stories and, and the work that you do uh, really reminds us all, you know, that we're so lucky to be in community with incredible people. Uh, the San Francisco Pride Board thanks you all for doing the work that you do and being part of the Lavender Series. And so as we wind down, I have one final question for all of you. Cultural districts are like the mini prides that exist 365 days of the year. And so for me, once I see that huge LGBTQ flag, and as, at a, as I mentioned earlier, at the top of Castro and Market, 
I stand a little bit taller and my heart flutters. I think a lot of us feel this way. I do the same when I walk through the tenderloin and I see the transgender flag and I know that, you know, history has been made. And also because I know the founders and they're my friends and they're just incredible people. Um, but also now, how exciting, the, the leather flag, which will be, it's new. It's, you know, the first of its kind. So I know what it means to be proud of our community when I step into these districts. Uh, what about you? We'll start with Julia. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Um, what? Well, if I could, you know, if I could just pivot just a little bit yep. and just really share, because I wanted to answer that last question around a little sneak peek. And so as I've been sort of meditating and trying to figure out, like, what is this post-COVID cultural district world look like? Um, a couple of things that come to me because I love the cultural districts and what it stands for so much and what it feels like. I took a drive just like literally a couple of days ago and drove all through the different cultural districts to feel the, the, the energy of what, what, what are these barren streets, however filled with our people living on them, right? Let's not forget folks who are unhoused, but are out there. Um, these, these walls and these homes and these districts are still alive. Um, although emptier um, visually. And, and what came to me when I was driving through all of the San Francisco cultural districts is this, this one is that this is really a time forced upon us to do some reflection. So I'm, ex I'm hoping that the board, these leaders really take this time to, to have a break, right? From always engaging in human interaction and really are reflecting inwards around like, what does it mean to be a cultural district? What are the next steps? And, and figuring that out, right? Um, and then looking at some of these challenges and we, um, that our community members are having, like hearing uh, Aria describe our folks being like really fearful around going out, addressing some of that trauma within individual spirits. You know, that is, this is the time to work on doing that. And then finally, like, honestly, even though we're so challenged, actually the cultural districts needs to go worldwide. Like it, we're not just a hub for San Francisco and the region, we're, we are a hub for the world. So we want it, we want the, the, the trans cultural district and the LGBTQ and the, the leather district to be accessible by our people that are living in other countries and around the world, right? So how do we really actually use this as an opportunity to reflect inwards and be accessible outwards? So I'm excited and I think there's actually more work to do as cultural districts and it's, and it's gonna be beautiful. Sparks. Um, yeah, I mean, similar to, um, to what, what Julia was saying, I, I think that one thing that, that really excites me, um, and excites our board is, is this, you know, that this is a new animal and that this can have a tremendous effect across the, the world. I know that, um, I, you know, I live right in the heart of the Castro and as I walk by Harvey Milk's camera shop, I think about Will I ever, could I ever possibly make that much difference as, as one of our leaders has in history? And, and what an amazing opportunity the cultural districts are for all of us that are involved to actually play a part in creating a, a history, the cultural districts that could be you know, living, breathing, evolving um, for generations in, in the future. Um, I... I think if there's any way that we can really just move beyond global, uh, beyond local and, and have a global um, effect and, and a positive effect on LGBTQ communities um, across the world, that, um, that would definitely be a huge victory for our, our cultural district. Awesome. Bob? One of the great things about the Weather Pride flag and its location is you can see it from the freeway. And the freeway is elevated there. And every time I come back to town and go past the Leather Pride flag, I see that flag and I feel like I am home. And I know that my people are right down there. Mm. Aria. Um, yeah, I love what you said, Michelle, about um, having that visual and tangible experience of seeing a part of yourself reflected and you just stand a little bit taller. 
that is definitely the experience that we had when we put the trans flags up um, in the Tenderloin. And we were working with the city and the city was like, oh, that's gonna take a year. Well, you'll never have that in the time that you're asking for. And, oh, what would that even look like? And maybe we should do a town hall first. And we were like, no, we want we want the flags and we want them up right before Trans March. Um, and everyone was like, you can't do it. You can't do it. And we prayed, meditated, sent smoke signals, made phone calls. We did everything that we possibly could think of. And there was this magical experience where we started getting tagged on Instagram and people were coming out of their shops and posting photos um, of the DPW staff painting the flags on the pole. And then, you know, I came um, to work the next day and I just started sobbing because I just had never had that experience of seeing myself or my existence reflected so tangibly in something that you can't remove. Um, never had that. And I think it gave me so much pride and um, because pride, LGBT pride has been a complicated experience for someone like me um, where I indulge and celebrate, but oftentimes I don't always feel reflected. And I think, when that moment happened, I was like, this is what pride feels like. And this is exactly what it feels like. And it reminded me of the first time I went to Barcelona and there's like a whole community of uh, that region that is like, has these flags from, oh God, I forget the name of the country. They got absorbed into to Spain, but they were a separate country. Anyways, people have these flags everywhere. They're like on t-shirts, they're wearing them, they're in windows, they're in the street markets, the street vendors, and you can't, you're like, what is this flag? What's going on? And then you learn a piece of the history. And trans folks in the neighborhood and allies started putting trans flags in their windows. SROs were hanging trans flags from their marquees, all in our neighborhood. And it just, it just made us so proud to be trans. Um, oftentimes the narrative is, you know, as trans people, you know, with the disparity that we face, um, there's this assumption that, you know, we're not proud of our bodies, um, that something is wrong and we're apt to, you know, actively trying to correct it, right? Um, and that's like the trans experience. But it was a really unique experience to celebrate specifically being trans and in the tenderloin and knowing that our ancestors and, and trans women that are living today um, really paved the way for us. Um, and because of oral storytelling, um, because our history is often not documented and it's often erased, um, we, we have access to that legacy and it's there and it's, in, it's cemented in the ground. And there's no feeling like that. We are cemented in this world, in, 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 in our time, in our, in our history, and, and we're here, and we're still here, and it is pride, happy pride. I wanna thank all of our panelists for being here uh, with us for the Lavender series, and also for the work that they do in keeping us um, alive, really. And thank you to San Francisco Pride for being a partner with us in the Lavender series. There's more to come. Check out the full listing at commonwealthclub.org slash online. I want to thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you to our sponsors for making this happen, Comcast and the rest of the San Francisco Pride Legacy Partners, um, and we'll see you next time.